Welcome to Exploring the Question, brought to you by the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. I'm your host, Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Foundation. In today's episode, we want to ask how important virtue was to the founding generations of the American Republic. Virtually all of the founders, Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Madison, said something about the importance of the new republic's leaders and citizens being moral. I mean, consider the Northwest Ordinance, which explicitly stated in Article 3 that religion, morality, and knowledge were necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. That's a bold, that's a strong statement. Well, to explore the question of the necessity of virtue in the American founding, I'm joined by Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, a historian of early America and the presidency. She's written a wonderful book. It's called Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of the of an American institution. It was published in 2020 by Harvard University Press. So I've got a lot of uh, interesting questions, but before, just let me say a little bit more about Dr. Chervinsky. She teaches fittingly at George Washington University and is a senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University and in Dallas. And prior to her current post, she was a presidential historian with the White House Historical Association. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for exploring some questions with me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Well, let's start with a big question people ask these days. How could the very same people who emphasize the importance of virtue in the new republic either own slaves or knowingly profit from the slave trade or support laws well into the 1780s, even in the North, uh, that permitted chattel slavery? You're right, that is the big question that often comes up and I'm regularly asked, you know, how do you wrap your mind around writing a book around some, about someone who has done such extraordinary things and, and also did some, some pretty bad things? And the answer lies in that conundrum. Humans are very complicated and they are often deeply flawed and regularly are, make choices that don't accord with their values and the founding generation was no different. They either had ideas that we would find to be very uncomfortable about race, that people with dark skin were less than, and there were people that felt that way and justified slavery accordingly. There were people who felt that slavery was bad, but they weren't really sure what to do about it. And people like Thomas Jefferson fall into that category where he, believed the institution was harmful both to those enslaved, but also those who did the enslaving. He felt that it corrupted people who held others in bondage. And then there is a last category of people who opposed slavery as a political principle, but didn't quite know how to extract themselves from the daily interactions that surrounded slavery. So people like John Adams is a great example. John Adams opposed slavery, especially as a political matter. And yet when he lived in Philadelphia, every time he went to the president's house and visited with George Washington, he was served by enslaved people. His carriage would have been tended to by enslaved people. The food that he ate would have been prepared by an enslaved chef. And as far as we can tell, he didn't ever say anything about that or make any sort of objection. So there's really a range of moral and intellectual compromises that most people at the time had to make. Now, does that make it right? Of course not. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's important to understand the, the range of behavior and understand that they too were deeply flawed and sometimes cruel people. Absolutely. And a background question might be uh, about the dynamic tension between the inherited religious culture of the founders uh, brought over with them and inculcated in uh, rising generations, and the upstart scientific thinkers of the Enlightenment. Now, the founders spanned a great many positions regarding these two big cultural forces, uh, Christianity and Enlightenment, and they aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, how did our founders resolve those tensions between Christian idealism and scientific progress? Well, I think you're right to emphasize that they aren't mutually exclusive, especially the way that Christianity was practiced in the 18th century. It's really important we don't apply 21st century ideas about organized religion to the 18th century because they, they do not fit on nicely. And when we talk about the 18th century and, and the, the framers and the founding generation, there's also a range within there. So 
people like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, they were all religious-ish. They certainly believed in some sort of divine force or providence. They all sort of fell on the range of Deus, but within um, a, a very wide uh, variety. John Adams was a little bit more inclined towards what we would consider to be a traditional Christian, although he had real concerns and qualms about organized religion, whereas Thomas Jefferson was perhaps the most exploratory in, in how religion could be uh, incorporated into the daily life. And so, especially for someone like Thomas Jefferson, who believed that there was this divine force, but didn't really have a sense of just how much power this divine force had, or how much this divine force maybe interacted in a day-to-day -day way, enlightenment thinking and exploration and scientific questions naturally fit hand in hand with that question. Because if you could figure out where science ended, then maybe you could figure out where providence began. So these ideas, this sort of questioning, this sort of flexibility, curiosity about the nature of uh, a divine force is, is really important to understand when we think about the, the 18th century and that culture. That's a wonderfully nuanced answer to the question. And a lot of people, I guess, would just ask for kind of that yes, no. Does one have to be religious to be virtuous? What did the founders think? Well, it really depends on who you ask. Um, John Adams believed that Religion was the best way to establish a set of values, but he didn't necessarily think it was the only way. And people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson were certainly comfortable with many of the values that Christianity imparted in terms of taking care of one's neighbor, in terms of trying to better oneself, the concept of you know, sin and virtue. But they certainly didn't think it was the only way to have principles, and they didn't think that their form of Christianity was the only way to apply those principles. So they were fully on board with the concept that someone who practiced the Jewish religion might have their own set of values that would contribute virtue and morality to their life, and they were fine with that. So it was really a matter of making sure you had a sense of a set of, of morals and virtues and they just thought that religion was often the, the best and maybe even easiest way to impart that into a society. Great. You know, we're moving now from a little bit more abstraction to the more concrete. So let's drill down into the lives of two of the founders, George Washington, the first president of the United States, and John Adams, his vice president, and the second president of the United States. You've been studying uh, Adams, I know, a lot. We'll get into that in your next book later. But let's look first at Washington in terms of the different ways of being virtuous. Now, I'm, I'm a very Aristotelian thinker in this. I, I go back and, you know, there's intellectual virtue. There's, there's the, the ability to think rightly, to use reason and evidence and construct sound arguments, valid arguments. And then there's what most of us think about being virtuous, the moral virtues, you know, having a good character with self-discipline, people you can trust, integrity, that kind of thing. And then there's civic virtue, the civic virtues, which go back to ancient Rome, Greece, but also were very much emphasized in our tradition in the Renaissance and among the founders. What, what intellectual and, and moral virtues do you take into the public square when you interact with others of your citizens, fellow citizens? And then there are the, what might be called existential or spiritual or religious virtues. So those are four categories. We might even touch on the physical virtues because of the contrast between Washington and Adams physically and how they used their presence. But let's let's start with with Washington. Just, let's just go down through those. What, what do you think of his intellectual virtue? Well, I love that you bring up all four because when we're talking about Washington's virtue, it's really important to remember that he is thinking about his personal virtue and striving to better this virtue at a time when American society is trying to decide what it looks like and what its values are going to be and how much of the British system they're going to adopt and how much their identity as little r Republicans is going to be in contrast to that British system, but recognizing that there's also a lot of it that they like. So 
in order to create a society of, of virtuous people, you have to have all of those different elements because society is not just one. It's not just intellectuals. It's not just moral values. It's not just religious values. So in terms of Washington's intellectual value, Washington believed very strongly in the importance of education. He believed very strongly that not having the means to have a traditional education, um, he, he was unfortunately unable to attend some of the more prestigious schools that his older brothers were because his father died when he was relatively young. And he didn't take that as an excuse. He was constantly trying to self-educate himself, seeking out new reading materials, everything from military treatises to Don Quixote after having a dinner with Benjamin Franklin and the Spanish minister and realizing that he hadn't read this book that they had and were speaking about in glowing terms. So education, the betterment of one's mind, constantly trying to um, improve his mind, but also then control his mind. So this is both sort of morality and character, but Washington had a very intense temper and he worked hard his entire life to control that to manage it. He did occasionally use it to his advantage, but that for me is part of his intellectual virtue is, is recognizing the importance of controlling one's mind as well as bettering it. And, and also, you know, we had a recent conversation on stage here in Grand Rapids in which you made an additional point about his intellectual virtue that I really appreciated when you pointed out that he was not afraid to surround himself by, by people who were considered brighter than he was, who were better educated. And of course, you think of, of, of Hamilton and Jefferson being in his cabinet. I mean, talk about somebody who's intellectually secure in a sense. Yeah, that's right. One of his greatest strengths as a leader was his recognition of his own weaknesses. And while he was constantly trying to improve them and, and diminish those weaknesses, he also what didn't overcompensate for them. And so he brought into his first his councils of war as a commander as the commander in chief of the continental army and then into his cabinet people who knew things that he didn't people who had experiences that he didn't and could contribute knowledge and ideas and perspectives that would help him make better choices and in terms of science we've seen there have been a number of studies on small businesses and organizations and and big businesses if a leader surrounds themselves with a diverse group of people they make better choices. The businesses are more successful financially. They're less likely to avoid groupthink. And so Washington was an early model of that long before he had the statistics to back it up. Was he a good listener, really? He was. He was a tremendous listener because he rarely went into a meeting with, a, with his mind made up. He didn't often go into a council of war or into a cabinet with a set plan about what he wanted to execute. Instead, he went in with a list of questions and he wanted the people around him, whether it be officers or then cabinet secretaries to debate those questions. And he didn't mind if that debate got contentious. Now, sometimes they minded, but he didn't mind because it was a way for him to allow the secretaries or the officers to stress test the other positions, to poke holes in the other arguments and he would take all the information in and then sit with it and consider the different perspectives, study if they wrote written reports afterwards, which he often requested, he would study that information. So he was really deliberate in how he made choices. And you can't be that deliberate if you're not listening to what people are saying. We love to ask that question at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and then the museum on the other side of this wall because Ford was famous. Now, this is not politically correct nowadays, but he always had that pipe and he would go through 10 bowls full of pipe a day, a puffing on it, not inhaling, but a, a puffing on it. And of course, that made him when, when he had that pipe in his mouth, he had to listen. And he was by nature that kind of a person anyway, but it's a symbol of how important listening was to him. And he could have the strongest personalities in the room, the Alan Greenspans, the Dick Cheney's, the Don Rumsfeld's, the Alan Greenspans, listen to all of them, puff on his pipe, and then uh, say something at the end of the meeting saying, this is what we're going to do now that I've heard all of you. And it was just a, it's a great symbol here. Okay, well now, what about Washington's moral virtues? Uh, in what areas did he particularly excel? And you've already hinted it in one area where he did not, and that was sometimes controlling that fierce temper of his. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, Washington's sense of morality is a little bit foreign to us today because they often called it Republican virtue. And again, this is little r Republican. And the reason it's foreign to us is because if you asked 18th century Americans what Republican virtue meant, you were likely to get a different answer from each person. It tended to be very personal as most conceptions of virtue are, but it also tended to be very regional. So different types of different regional cultures had a different emphases on, on how you were supposed to demonstrate that Republican virtue. But to give a general perspective, it meant basically that you were supposed to be generous, both in spirit, in terms of your time and service and perhaps funds. You were supposed to take care of those who were less fortunate than you. The best men were supposed to serve. You were supposed to comport yourself with dignity and dress with care, but not necessarily too much flashiness. So there was a difference between dressing well and, and presenting yourself that was considered to be appropriate and expected for virtuous Republicans, but, but not too much, not, not overdoing it. Um, in society, you are supposed to be polite and um, what, what we would think of, at, they called condescending, which is not, you know, we have a very negative connotation to that word, but condescending to your inferiors was a positive thing at the time. And for Washington, what that meant in practice was because the best men were supposed to serve, that often included a, a very significant element of sacrifice. So he didn't wanna be away from home for eight years during the war. He didn't want that second term. I don't actually think he wanted the first term, but he understood that his participation and his role was essential. His, he had a belief in the cause. And so therefore this commitment personally, financially, emotionally, physically was required of him. And that was the utmost in terms of morality and virtue was, was giving yourself to something, even if it meant that it wasn't always going to be very fun. And the women of his day also were expected to be morally virtuous. And Martha Washington was a woman of great virtue. Uh, you want to say something about Martha Washington, the expectations of the day? Yeah. So getting back to this concept of, you know, they're building this society from scratch that requires the participation and the buy-in of women as well as men. And what they considered to be the utmost in female perfection was the concept of Republican motherhood. And the idea behind Republican motherhood was that if, if you're going to have a next generation of virtuous citizens, you have to have someone to raise those virtuous citizens. And you have to have someone to teach them morality, to educate them, to teach them to read, to teach them the appropriate virtues and values, to encourage them to be virtuous Republicans. And so the, the utmost role for women was to raise a family in this way, was to encourage their husbands in this sacrifice or public service as appropriate. They were supposed to be fairly demure. They were supposed to be fairly modest and chaste. They were not necessarily supposed to be um, particularly public in their activities, although there, there were a very important element of sort of semi-public, semi-private spaces where people like Martha Washington and Abigail Adams would host events in which the very important behind the scenes political networking and engagement would take place. They were supposed to be educated because you cannot educate your children and you cannot raise children to be good citizens if you yourself can't read and write. They were supposed to be relatively religious, but again, what that meant was a little bit different depending on who you were talking to. So women played a very essential role in this conception of creating this new society and, and supporting the men in the service that they were expected to provide. Um, it, it is not a role of female participation that in the 21st century we're particularly comfortable with, but it is one that our society has gone back to time and time again. And there were women of the day who were, quite intellectual, uh, perhaps, well, I think definitely uh, the match and in some cases the superior of their husbands. You know, um, I don't think Abigail Adams has to take a backseat to anybody. And then somebody like Mercy Otis Warren was just remarkable. In fact, in our profession, you and I are historians. I mean, she actually was helping craft uh, an interpretation of the American Revolution and American founding, which is really impressive and, and is read to this day. I mean, it's a uh, it's a book that I wish more people read, but 
you're you're absolutely right. I think that um, women actually at this time perhaps were emerging uh, out of the Enlightenment, you know, uh, forces. Okay, well now let's look at uh, Washington's civic virtue. What do you, what do you think about that? The Republican virtue, little R. Yeah, so Washington's civic virtue I touched on this a bit in terms of the importance of service and sacrifice. A republic was something that required the buy-in of its participants, required the buy-in of its citizens. It required care and attention and could easily flounder without the support and the vigilance towards uh, Republican political participation. And Washington was intensely aware of the potential for floundering. It's always, I, I love reminding people that in 1789, when Washington took office, this government was already on its second chance. The, conf the Confederation government, the Articles of Confederation had failed. And most republics, most governments, but most republics especially, don't get second chances because they devolve into anarchy or tyranny. And as students of history, which they all were, they were intensely aware of this likelihood of failure. And so Washington was always attentive to the possibility of slippage of, of virtue in terms of civic participation. And uh, his, his contemporaries, people like John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, they had different ideas necessarily about what that civic participation should be. But John Adams, too, was always aware of the possibility of slippage and was perhaps even more pessimistic about that possibility than Washington was. Yeah, he was he was sort of the nervous Nelly among the founders and just always seemed to have a, a dark view of the chances of survival for the republic. Well, exactly what we're talking about, the survival of republic. Yeah, I would call him, I wouldn't necessarily even call him necessarily a pessimist as a very intense realist. He was very realistic about human nature, and he worried that it would constantly get the better of political institutions, and wrote a, a really fascinating letter when he was president about the fact that our constitution is not drafted for immoral people, because there aren't that many guardrails against immoral or illegal behavior. It requires people to comport themselves with a certain amount of virtue. And if they don't, then things go badly pretty quick. Um, and so, you know, that to me is actually a very prescient warning that so much of our system is based on people doing the right thing. And when they don't, sometimes we don't know how to handle it. Well, that actually, I think, uh, segues well into our last category of virtue, uh, you know, variously called existential or spiritual or religious theological type virtues. What about Washington and sort of th that very deep core of him? Uh, what could you say about that? Washington had a deep sense of what he called fate or providence. He was not particularly religious in his day-to-day -day practice. He did not um, go to church all that often. He regularly went to different types of churches depending on where he was, which was actually fairly common practice in the 18th century. Uh, I, I get the sense that he went because it was what was expected of him as opposed to a regular practice that he took comfort in. I think he found a concept of providence much more in day-to-day -day activities in what we would think of sort of as communing with nature, not that he would ever use that language. Um, but where we see this most is his conviction that he was destined for something great and he was destined to play a role in historic events and survive challenges. And so we see him in the Seven Years' War and then in the Revolutionary War taking risks that most people probably shouldn't take. He had many horses shot out from underneath him. He had bullet holes in his coat that miraculously failed to hit flesh. And he just had the sense that he was destined to continue. And that to me is a a direct line to his conviction that there is this providential hand guiding things forward. Very good. Uh, and and I think one of the, the key elements also, something you just touched on with John Adams, one of the chief existential or spiritual virtues is not to despair. You, you, you cannot despair or show despair to others. Uh, that, that would be a failure, considered a failure of leadership. Okay, well now let's let's go through the same with John Adams. 
intellectual virtue. Wow. This guy's smart. <laughs> yeah. You know, John Adams is, um, his defense of the constitution gets a bit of a bad rap and rightfully so, because it's not the smoothest read, but John Adams was perhaps the deepest political thinker of the, at least the early founding generation. Thomas Jefferson was more of a Renaissance man. And so he read in, in more subjects but Adams read so deeply in political theory and government and constitution and theology. And the way that we, we can really see his impact, the longest surviving written constitution. So the longest surviving constitution for a nation is of course the United States constitution, but the longest surviving written constitution was the Massachusetts constitution. And John Adams was the author of the Massachusetts constitution. And it, both contributed tremendously to the formation of the national constitution, but the ideas that he was articulating in his defenses were delivered to the United States in serial form and serial publications during the summer of 1787 when the national constitution is being drafted. And the people present at the convention were discussing his political ideas. And so his political thinking is perhaps actually the most influential long-term to our nation than anyone else. I'm so glad to hear you say that. I mean, it needs to be shouted from the rooftops. And some of my research indicates that Adams also influenced some of the most important passages in the Northwest Ordinance. And the Northwest Ordinance, even though the, the Confederation government was a failure, the Confederation Congress's crown jewel, bar none, was this incredible Northwest Ordinance, which covers the importance of education and prohibits slavery in the Northwest and urges us to treat Native Americans fairly, deal in, in good faith with them. And my understanding is that Adams also had a profound impact on that organic law of our land. That's true. And one other element that often gets overlooked, he had a real conviction about the importance of economy and trade. So while Jefferson and Hamilton were sort of squabbling over who should be the closest ally in terms of France or Great Britain, often for diplomatic reasons, Adams was convinced that the only way the nation was going to survive and thrive was through its growing economy and the potential of this growing economy. So not only was he instrumental in obtaining certain treaties for trade during the revolution in which he spent almost a decade in Europe, but he also obtained loans that allowed the government to continue to function. So his ideas about the importance of the economy to the nation and how the nation would move forward were really central and perhaps central to the nation's emergence as a superpower because it took a long time, it took a really long time and the economy was the thing that pushed it over the edge. Yes, well, John Adams, was a very sensitive soul, I would say. He was very temperamental. Sometimes it seems he had a little difficulty controlling his, his, his emotions. Um, what would you say about his moral virtue, his character? <laughs> well, so this is one of the things that I actually, I love the most about John Adams because I think that he is so relatable. He did not burn huge swaths of his correspondence, like Martha Washington burned her correspondence with George. And I think if we had that, Washington would feel a lot more relatable because I have no doubt that he put his concerns and fears and worries and sarcasm and snark and all of the juicy bits would have been in those letters. But because we don't have those and, and same with Jefferson, he burned all of his correspondence with his wife. We don't, we can do our best to get at their inner inner souls, but we're limited by what they left behind. And John Adams left so much more behind. And he, in addition to leaving so much more behind, tended to be much more of an open book anyway. So I love how relatable he is. I love that he thinks that, you know, ambition is a sin and yet he is woefully ambitious and he knows it. And so he's constantly trying to battle this ambition of wanting to be recognized as one of the leading figures in the nation, but knowing he should really just be a farmer and be content with his lot as a farmer. And he loved his farm, but he also wanted to be one of these celebrated figures. And so the constant battle in his head between that, the constant battle that he desperately wanted recognition for his contributions and his service and his sacrifice, which was extraordinary. 
but it didn't match up in the public mind to the military sacrifice of people like Washington. And that irked Adams to no end. It drove him crazy. He was, <laughs> it just, it drove him crazy. Um, and so, you know, what I love about Adams, in, and this is true, I think, for most of the Adams family, it also for his son, they are acutely aware of where they fall short and they are constantly trying to improve it. They had a very, Puritan sensibility. They came from Puritan stock. And so the concept of constantly trying to improve oneself, of trying to master those emotions to assert control over one's weaknesses, they never fully succeeded, but they never stopped trying. And I, I love that about them. Yes, he really is an open book and, and his fits that he would have in the presence of others. I mean, you know, he, he well, as our younger generations say, Keep it real. And he kept it real, I think, through the entire American Revolution. Yeah, okay. there's a, a great quote, which um, I drew inspiration on for this second book. Benjamin Franklin, when they were serving together abroad in France, said, John Adams is often a wise man. He is always an honest man. But in some things, he's absolutely out of his senses. And I just think that that is the perfect encapsulation of who he was. It really is. What about his civic virtue? Well, so here he um, he doesn't really have, he has few rivals in, in this area. He dedicated his life to public service. He had a similar concept of sacrifice and the importance of duty. Everything from defending the British soldiers after the Boston Massacre because he believed in the importance of a fair trial and he understood that few people would be willing to defend them to you know, taking on the diplomatic assignments that no one really wanted that were often thankless tasks to serving as the second president of the United States, that position was going to be terrible. It was going to be awful for whoever took that office because the American people were comfortable with Washington in office. They knew what it meant to have Washington as president and everyone else was going to fall short and he did it anyway. And so in some ways, and actually this would be a, it's both a virtue in terms of his civic virtue and also where he falls short. He loved sort of what we would think of as taking on the man. He loved when he was the underdog. He loved when he was the person going against public opinion because he thrived on that. He thrived on, you know, proving people wrong and sort of thumbing his nose at the expected course or expected action. Now, Maybe he did so a little bit out of pride, and that's where I think that that would be a failing, but it sure makes for interesting writing. And of course, there are those religious virtues, those spiritual virtues. Adam is, is such a deep-souled individual. What are you finding in your research about that? Well, this is one of the more interesting elements of my research, especially after writing about Washington, because, you know, in some ways they are remarkably similar. They spent most of their adult lives in public service. They're of the same generation. They are both committed nationalists and deeply dedicated to the American Republic. But other than that, in terms of culturally, in terms of presentation, in terms of you know, thinking about their relationships, they're about as different as two white dudes could be in the 1790s. And um, so, and, and religion is part of that because they do come from really different cultural backgrounds. John Adams is, at the time, they would call it Congregationalists. That is a successor to the Puritan religion. He comes from deep Puritan stock. He was actually supposed to be a minister and then decided he didn't really want to do that and became a lawyer instead. His wife was the daughter of ministers. So the sort of the family practice had often been deeply involved with the small community church. And he did have questions about certain aspects of organized religion. There were things he was deeply uncomfortable with. There were concepts in the Congregationalist doctrine that he found to be questionable. And so he, he was certainly not someone who accepted it all on the page. He had a lot of questions, but I think he had a deeper sense and a deeper commitment to religious principles than someone like Jefferson or Washington did. And it certainly shaped his culture. When we think of what it means to be sort of a New England Puritan, the concept of modesty and sacrifice and small town living. It, it's very difficult to describe, but I think we all kind of have a, an image in our mind of what that is. 
and John Adams and Abigail Adams as well. They shared this sense of culture and virtue, very much embodied that New England Puritan aesthetic. Don't you think, you mentioned Abigail, we talked a little bit about her earlier. I, I think she was his match. I, he, he was an extraordinarily intelligent man, but her letters, I think, also show just an incredible intellect. What do you think about that? Oh, absolutely. She was both his match and an excellent compliment in a lot of ways. So she was very well educated for a woman at the time. She didn't have the official education like John did. She didn't go to Harvard or anything like that, but she was very well educated, especially in things like the classics. So they can go blow for blow with, you know, insinuations and references and all that kind of thing. She was committed to continuing self-education and the importance of broadening one's horizons. So she was deeply read for the duration of her life. She liked theater and music and liked to participate in cultural activities. She also in some ways was better than him at certain things. So he recognized pretty early on that she was very financially savvy and she took care of all of the finances, both their personal accounts, their farms, but she also took care of their investments and speculation. So she made sure that they made money during the war, which was not easy to do. And at a time when women did not have legal rights to things like, especially married women did not have things right to things like property or bank accounts. So she had a family member who would do her bidding appointed power of attorney so that she could continue to manage these things when John was unavailable. And then one of the you know, greatest elements of their marriage is that he could be hot-headed, he could be temperamental and uh, often would get frustrated. She was much more of a natural optimist. She tended to be more calm, so she centered him until she didn't. She was very loyal and she was a very loyal wife. And the one thing that ruined her natural calmness was when people were critical of John and then she kind of lost it, which I find very endearing and very human and very relatable. I do too. It's, it's actually a wonderful constellation of qualities that she has. It makes them as a couple, as you say, fascinating. I mean, their letters and all the things. And if only we had those letters from Washington to Sally Fairfax. <laughs> True. It's true. <laughs> okay. Um, just a couple of additional questions before we wrap up, Lindsay. Um, in your interactions with all the readers and audiences that you've encountered, what, what's the biggest misconception we Americans have about the founders? So I think that there are two, and they're very much interrelated. When people say the founders believed, that's generally a red flag because they agreed on almost nothing. And so to say the founders believed is, is, a, is a problem because there were very rarely just one belief. Now, this was true of everything from foreign policy to slavery to nationalism to the amount of power that states should have, you name it, there was pretty broad disagreement. And that manifests itself in a constitution that is a hodgepodge of compromises. Now that doesn't mean it's not a brilliant document and that it hasn't survived for, for centuries because it obviously has, but it was a hodgepodge of compromises that they made to try and ensure that there was a better option on the table than what they already had. When Washington left the Constitutional Convention in September of 1787, he sent a copy of it to several people and he said, this is the best that could be had at the moment. It is not exactly like a glowing, you know, tablet handed down from the mountaintop kind of description. And he said, you know, I hope future generations will amend it. And that perspective was shared widely. There was an understanding that future generations would encounter problems that they had no way of predicting. And they knew that there were problems that they, they could predict and they had not yet solved. Slavery, of course, being the number one issue on the front of their minds, which they all decided basically not to put into the document. So John Adams thought that maybe the Constitution would last 10 years. Jefferson hoped that each generation would give it a pretty substantial refresh. And why that's so important, why that's such an important misconception is we tend to attribute superhuman qualities to the founding generation. They were brilliant men. They were unparalleled in their intellect, but they were flawed and they were humans and they did the very best that they could to come up with 
a roadmap, but they treated it just like a roadmap. They believed that people, once they were in office, were going to have to be flexible and experiment and try new things in order to face the challenges that would be around the corner for a very new nation. And if anything, treating them like these superhuman figures and treating their wisdom like it is almost a religious or, or holy relic is a disservice to their creativity and their conviction that each generation needed to try and improve on the one before it. Those are insightful. Those are terrific and powerful words on which to close. Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky, thank you so much for being our thoughtful guest today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be with you. Thank you. And you know, here at the Ford, we seek a more perfect union by inspiring the better angels of our nature. And Lindsay's scholarly work helps us see more clearly the nuanced history of the American founding and the people who were in it. And for our friends of Ford, her work sheds new light on the importance of virtue and understanding American culture and leadership, the focus of our new initiative in the Ford Leadership Forum. So for all those reasons, we are just delighted that she has joined us and we'll want to bring Lindsay back to Grand Rapids when it is easier to host public programs because there is so much, much more to learn from her. Well, from the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, I'm Gleavis Whitney, exploring the question. Uh, well, Lindsay, you know, we're, we're going to be going into the 250th anniversary of our country, as you know, and of course, President Ford was helping us celebrate the bicentennial back in 1976. And mm -hmm. so I just very like boldly to propose that we just go back to you again and again as we prepare and um, just, you know, just be prepared to, to kind of camp out at the Ford in 2026. <laughs> I would be delighted. Yeah, it's going to be, um, it is It is both going to be a very big moment because as it should be as a, the 250th anniversary, but especially as when it, when it is coming at a time in our country, when I think we're at a real boiling point or turning point or, you know, something um, and having to figure out what we want to do. And, and especially with history being such a contested part of that, um, it's going to be, it will be something. But I would be very interested in your thoughts down the road about, you know, tearing down statues and uh, mm -hmm. desecrating them or moving them to museums or how we as a community should handle those things. Because I know you have very good thoughts about some of those. I do. I have lots of thoughts and I will happily share them with you all. For me, the one that is most pressing is actually this effort to ban books. Um, it's, it is both a historic um, there are a lot of historic ties to, to the founding period and, and to our contemporary moment. And that is another one that I think will be a topic of conversation for the next several years. So there are lots of things we can discuss. Mm -hmm.